this talk seeks to offer a new solution or uh, new ideas about, in any case, a long-standing problem in the field of Roman spatial studies, uh, namely the very complicated relationship uh, between historical texts and the archaeological record. And when I'm talking about texts, I'm of course talking about poems, plays, uh, histories written uh, by primarily by uh, Roman authors, but also by Greeks in some cases. Uh, traditional studies of space in the classical world have sought to create direct connections, almost a one-to-one -one connection in many cases, uh, between text and site. Um, one only needs to think about the, the big digs, for instance, of the 19th century. Figures like Heinrich Schliemann, for instance, who was running off to various sites around the Eastern Mediterranean, having read a copy of the Iliad and trying to, to basically prove the existence of uh, various people, places, and events that took place in that particular poem. But this isn't something that ended in the 19th century. This is something that is still continuing today um, on uh, Roman sites across the Mediterranean world, particularly in, in settlements and in urban centers. So I'm just going to start off by giving an example of this um, and what the sort of things I'm, I'm talking about you know, in this, this uh, paper will look like. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, an example from Rome itself, and this would be the uh, excavations, quite well known excavations of uh, Andrea Carandini on the north slope of the Palatine Hill, uh, conducted roughly between 1985 and 2005. I can never figure out exactly what the dates are, but it's something like that. Um, these are very well known excavations in a, an important part of the city. We're right in the heart of Rome, uh, here between the Forum and the Palatine Hill here. And of course, the Palatine. Uh, is the legendary home uh, of the settlement of Romulus, uh, Rome's founder, Rome's progenitor, in a sense, he, he, its namesake. And according to legend, legend written down by Vero and by Livy and by other Roman historians, uh, the story goes that uh, Romulus founded the settlement on the Palatine and built a wall around it in 753 BC, more specifically April 21st, 753 BC, that's Rome's birthday, right? And so Carandini was very interested in this, this legend and used his excavations to essentially prove its veracity. Um, he went into it looking for this, and not surprisingly, he was able to find evidence. In fact, he presents a sort of index of, of various types of evidence that indicate that it is, in fact, uh, a settlement of Romulus that's built uh, in the middle uh, of the 8th century BC. Now, the question is, is this evidence uh, particularly reliable? And I would argue that it's uh, not so much. So for instance, uh, Kennedy claims to have found the very first furrow, the ditch dug around, this, this, this is the so-called uh, sulcus primaganius, the ditch dug around the Palatine Hill by Romulus, thus establishing the boundaries uh, of this particular settlement. Um, now, the evidence for this is pretty limited. Um, we, there are stratified uh, artifacts that seem to date to the 8th century BC, but there's definitely nothing associating this ditch specifically with the figure, figure of Romulus. And indeed, I would be uncomfortable um, even if in the fill of that ditch I found a sign that said dug by Romulus, I would still feel uncomfortable attributing that ditch to Romulus, but this is not a problem uh, for Carandini. And in fact, he goes one step further by actually reconstructing the entire circuit of the Romulian walls around the Palatine Hill that are supposed to have been built in 753 BC and includes, as you can see here, uh, a reconstruction of that act by Romulus. Um, and so this is what is thought to have happened based on the excavations of Carandini uh, on the Palatine. Uh, this is a pretty extreme example of using archaeology to prove historical uh, text to be accurate. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that happens on a regular basis. And in, in my own uh, 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 specific field, my own subfield, which is Roman domestic architecture and household archaeology, we find the same thing happening. Um, perhaps not in such an explicit way, but certainly the sources uh, directly influence our perception of how we understand the construction of space and, and the use of space. Um, and I think that this, this situation is very much tied to the, the uh, notion of classical archaeology as a discipline, its disciplinary identity. Um, and in recent years, there's been a bit more um, sort of self-reflection. Um, scholars have started to, to think a bit more about what classical archaeology ar excuse me, classical archaeology actually looks like. And so I've stolen a couple of quotes here from an Anthony Snodgrass uh, article written in 2007, but I think these sort of summarize, the, I guess, the, the two extreme positions. 
So on the one hand, we might think of classical archaeology as being a, a branch of classical studies intended specifically to sort of prove uh, or to, to um, illustrate the, the textual record. Uh, so that's, that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we might view classical archaeology uh, as a branch of archaeology, a subdiscipline of the field of archaeology that deals specifically with the archaeology of the Mediterranean basin, uh, the Greek and Roman worlds, as it, as it were. Now, I suspect that no one in this room has ever actually seen that as the definition of classical archaeology. Um, and indeed, for, let's, well, let's say, for a very long time, um, we're, we're probably somewhere on this end of the scale, certainly in, uh, in terms of, of the tradition of what classical archaeology uh, is. Now, uh, thanks to some, I guess, improvements in terms of methodology and the occasional dalliance with theory in the 1980s and early 1990s, I think things have started to shift slightly um, to the right. And indeed, you could argue that that period of self-reflection uh, that I was mentioning before that occurs in the early 2000s and continues on today has shifted things perhaps even a bit further to the right. Uh, but for me, and I think for other people of my generation who consider themselves to be classical archaeologists, uh, we would like to move things um, even a bit further, uh, further to the right. Um, I'm not saying that we should completely be disassociating text from sight. Uh, that's not really something that that would make any sense because we have these two very useful sources of evidence. Um, but at the same time, um, by adopting a more judicious approach to the use of textual evidence, um, and perhaps by subjecting those texts to more rigorous, maybe even scientific analysis, uh, I think there are ways that we can arrive at a more effective union between these two categories of evidence. So if, for example, we applied, say, statistical analysis to a large corpus of texts, Let's say we do that, and we can identify prominent themes or, or values um, that are shared across an entire culture. If we can find evidence of this across the full corpus of texts, and this, these seem to be shared ideas, then can we not perhaps identify connections between those values and ideas and archaeological context, archae the archaeological record? And so the rest of this talk is basically focusing on uh, an example of, of that type of approach. Uh, and the example that I'm using here um, is the uh, concept of lateral asymmetry, which is just a fancy term for um, the human preference for one side of the body over the other, right? Either the right or the left. And I'm sure, as most people in this room probably know, um, in the vast majority of human populations across time and across uh, geographical region, most people are right-handed, right? We're looking about 90% of the population uh, is right-handed and only 10% is left-handed. We left-handers, we've had it rough. You don't even know, right? How many left-handers do we have in here? I'm just curious. You, that's, yeah, that looks about right. Yeah, that's, that's probably pretty close to what it should be. Um, I've seen that it actually raises a little bit. We get a, a slightly higher number of those in academic audiences. I don't know why left-handers, but it just seems to happen. In any case, we've had it hard um, uh, throughout our entire lives, uh, but that's a, that's a talk for another day. Uh, in any case, what we do find is across societies, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of symbolism, the right becomes an incredibly important concept. Um, and, and again, you can we can look at this across a, a range of societies across the world. For the Romans, this is particularly the case. The concept of the right, the right hand, the right foot, the right side of the body is incredibly uh, incredibly powerful. Um, right and left sort of represent opposing signs uh, sides of the concept of fortuna, right, luck which is, uh, again, a very powerful concept to the Romans. Um, and so we can look at textual sources. Uh, we have uh, various other media that show the importance of the right hand being used on a regular basis. But that's obviously all anecdotal, right? I mean, this is exactly the sort of thing that I'm talking about. We, we, I can't just come up here and tell you that this stuff is appearing in text. What we'd like to be able to do is to have some sort of more rigorous approach to the analysis of those texts and, and examples of this. So if uh, <laughs> the best way to deal with this would be to, to build a topic model, um, to, to do topic modeling on this. Now, Topic modeling is essentially the application of uh, an algorithm, um, a statistical algorithm, to a large corpus of, of texts, uh, which allows you to pull out 
various concepts or topics from that broad uh, corpus. Ideas that are shared across the, the full uh, scope uh, of that, that corpus. Uh, and here's an example of what that sort of looks like. So this is a topic model of English books between 1850 and 1899. And what we can see is that the, uh, the types of topics that are coming out map on quite nicely onto some of the cultural themes and historical developments of this period. So there's a handful down here. I'm not going to go through them all, but you get the idea. And this would be the way to sort of look at lateral asymmetry and see how it fits um, uh, within sort of broader ideas about, uh, of, of Roman society and across this full, uh, the full expanse of Roman literature. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to build a topic model because I haven't digitized all of the Latin texts in the world yet. <laughs> That's something that I would like to do in the future. Um, but when I did research on this subject, which was now four or five years ago during my PhD, I don't even think I knew topic modeling existed. So what I did instead was, well, I basically did topic modeling but by hand, which was a terrible idea. Um, but it seems to have worked okay, I guess. Uh, so I went through basically the full corpus of Latin literature and sought out examples of dexter, that's right, being associated with the concepts of, uh, of favorable or, or lucky, good fortune, essentially. Uh, and as it turns out, this is something that appears quite regularly. Indeed, there's 54 examples of this occurring uh, throughout the entire um, uh, body of Roman literature. So I did that, and I was like, oh, well, I should do some more which was probably, again, not the best idea, but uh, it, it worked out okay. Again, uh, I decided to look at the opposite, so the left, sinister, um, and its, its associations with uh, the words unfavorable or unlucky. <laughs> and again, we see the same sort of thing happening here. Um, a large number, um, I think 37 in this instance, of passages that make reference to these, these concepts. So what I think that this suggests is that there is actual you know, statistical evidence that backs up this notion um, of, of the duality between right and left being, being very important uh, for the Romans in a way that maybe uh, even more so than in other cultures. So I'll come back to that in a second. Um, since 2009, um, I, I've been directing a, a an architectural survey uh, in the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, um, looking at the presence of permeable boundaries, so things like doors, screens, partitions, curtains, uh, uh, in the houses of the Vesuvian cities. Uh, and since the project started, uh, we've surveyed 31 houses over 650 doorways uh, on those two sites. We've also conducted ancillary excavation or excavations, uh, ancillary uh, surveys on other Mediterranean sites. Uh, and that's actually an important point. I'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, and uh, just as a plug, uh, the results of this are going to be published hopefully within the next year or so uh, from, uh, through Ashgate. Um, in any case, doing this survey, uh, there were a number of features in the doorways that we were looking at, um, a number of diagnostic features that we were looking at. So not only analyzing the door frame uh, and the lintel where present, but also the threshold. The threshold is particularly important um, in this, this process of analysis. When you're trying to figure out what type of boundary was present in a doorway, we look to the threshold first. And here's an example from the House of the Labyrinth at Pompeii, and you can immediately see, hopefully, that there are some diagnostic features here. We have this horizontal line running through. Uh, that represents the lip of a rebate. This is the rebate here, so this area is slightly higher. That functioned as a doorstop. Um, you can see on either end of the rebate, we have these circular sockets for the pivots of the doors. So we're looking at double doors here. This is, again, a, a universal feature uh, of, of domestic doorways in Roman houses. And then in the middle, we have two sockets for drop bolts, so that when the doors are closed, those bolts go in the sockets and hold the doors closed. Um, thanks to this arrangement, we can see that there's clearly a, a sense of frontality to most Roman doorways. There's an outside and a defined inside, the doors opening away in almost every instance as you move through a, a Roman house. They're moving, the doors are opening away from you. So in the process of looking at these various features, um, I started to notice a, a trend, a pattern of use wear um, on the thresholds themselves. This only happened on a handful of thresholds before I actually started to pick up on it. Um, and we don't have a huge number of them, but the wear patterns are actually quite interesting. So if I zoom in on this particular threshold, what you can see is that on the right-hand side, right, on the right-hand side of the rebate, we have this circular wear pattern in the pivot socket and then an extension of that wear out onto the threshold itself, which suggest, suggests that 
thanks to the regular movement of this door leaf, the, the pivot socket actually, or the pivot actually moved out of the socket. So it was actually sitting in at an angle. Um, likewise, around the bolt, actually I think I have little arrows, yes. Um, around the bolt we have a, a, a another uh, mark, a drag mark, pulling back from the, uh, the bolt hole. Uh, all of this suggests, given that we don't have the same sort of features on the left side of the threshold, that the right side, the right hand leaf, was seeing much more activity than the left. And in fact, it's reasonable to imagine that the left hand leaf stood closed much of the time. Okay, so that's pretty well, I hope that's, that's clear. Having seen that, I went back and started to look at how regularly this was appearing uh, in the houses of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Now, there's a slight problem with this uh, in as much as uh, thresholds in these houses are replaced quite regularly. Um, this is just a, a feature of the domestic architecture in uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum. All right, okay. Um, uh, so that's that's just something that happens. So we only have a, a handful uh, of examples of this pattern. But in those examples that we do have, we can see that it is the right-hand side of the threshold that's producing these patterns of use wear. So, okay, that's fine. Can we connect that with these broader um, associations of, of the right that I was discussing previously? Based on that evidence, that's probably not enough. It's, it's still fairly anecdotal. It's consistent, but it's not, it's not great. So at that point, um, I started looking further afield and uh, looking at other sites where the domestic architecture is well preserved, where we have lots of thresholds. And so, for instance, at the site of Glanum in southern France, uh, we have uh, a house with a handful of reasonably well preserved thresholds. And in each instance where those thresholds produce diagnostic evidence, we see a wear pattern on the right side of the stone. Uh, in this case, you can see here, um, due to footwear, the, uh, the doorstop is almost completely worn away. And this again happens uh, in, in essentially every instance uh, in this house. Likewise, at Delos, um, uh, a, a site in the Eastern Mediterranean in the Aegean Sea uh, that the Romans arrive at in the second century BC, we find the same thing happening. So as individuals move from outside of the house in, they're regularly crossing the right side of the threshold over and over and over again to the point that Again, we're seeing this sort of wear where the doorstop is essentially uh, worn away entirely. I could show you many, many other examples of this phenomenon. You'll just have to take my word for it because obviously I don't have time to do that. But it, this does seem to be something that's happening quite regularly um, over and over again. So that being the case, what does that mean? Can we, can we connect um, the, this notion uh, of, of the right as sort of uh, represented in Roman literature with what we're seeing on the ground. Um, I'm just going to read this part because I want to make it very clear. So uh, it seems quite improbable that the symbolic benefits associated with choosing the right as described by Roman authors, that is to say uh, obtain good luck or to ward off evil, actually had any bearing on uh, on the movement of residents in the houses that I'm talking about here. I, I think that's unlikely. Indeed, it's, un, it's also unlikely that the consistent choice to move to the right side uh, was the result of active thought processes associated with, say, ancient myth or superstition. On the contrary, the textual sources suggest that the right-left duality was a deeply ingrained aspect of Roman culture. So favoring the right hand and the right foot was, rather than a conscious act on the part of individual agents, an example of culturally normative behavior. So this is a normal thing to do. Thus, it might not be surprising that corporeal associations of right and left might have manifested themselves in relatively mundane daily activities, particularly those in which the division between the two was made conspicuous. All right, so to put it in simpler terms, if the right and left door leaves were perceived as being representative of the binary division of the body, then cultural norms, rather than say personal choice, would have instructed individuals to move to the right. And that being the case, if we accept that that's a reasonable possibility, well, then we can start to think about how people move through space more generally in the house. That they're moving through doorways to the right, are they circulating in a counterclockwise motion, as you would do if you were moving uh, through doorways regularly on the right side? And those are the sorts of questions that maybe we can start to get at. Now, I would be very, very uncomfortable drawing the conclusions I've just drawn <laughs> if I was basing that on a single you know, example from uh, a single passage from, a, from one or two texts. But when we start to have multiple examples, right, across a wide range of texts and a wide range of time, then I think you can start to make a compelling case that this is something that's, that's reasonable and that um, 
and that movement to the right does reflect something that's uh, you know present in the, the whole of the Roman world. And I'll stop there because I think I'm out of time. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, here.